Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Conversations in the Future of Work. I am your host, Rachel Koster, and today we are talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart as a somatic and embodiment professional myself, former professional ballet dancer. We're going to talk about the future of embodied communication coaching with a good friend and wonderful thought leader in this space, Zaina Habib. Zaina, over to you to introduce yourself, please, to our audience today. Of course. Thank you so much, Rachel, for having me here today. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, present with your audience and with the people that we're going to be talking with. So my name is Zaina. I have been a coach for the last seven years, and I got into embodiment about like three, four years ago. I think the biggest thing for me was how do you link movement and the body with growth and um, motivation and this kind of different mindset that as an athlete or as a dancer you have on a daily basis, but maybe if you've been working for a long time or not very active, you don't have. And um, for me, it was a great transition from just being a project manager and kind of transformed my life. And it, I really do love the impact I see on people when we start working together. So I think this is the biggest thing for me. I am ICF certified um, and I have, well, I have had a certification for the last maybe four or five years now. And it's been a really nice to be able to support um, all the managers, the leaders. And I've worked a lot also with women around the world, especially mm. in the MENA region, and kind of be able to empower them to create the change they really want to do in their life. Beautiful. Well, we're so happy to have you. So thanks again mm. for joining. So we'll we'll start off with our first question. I know you were sharing a little bit about your your background in this space, but can you just share for the audience like what is embodied coaching and like how how did you actually develop your your coaching practice around this focus? Yeah, of course. So when I first started doing coaching seven years ago, I just went to a communication training and then they were like, you're really good at this. Do you want to be part of it? And then I realized that it is my thing and I love it. So I started working in it and one, it felt like something was missing. Like, great, I was able to kind of connect to new parts of myself, but the change itself, it was kind of a part that I wasn't be able to reach in a sense. And then being a dancer, I was like curious, like, what does it look like to kind of connect to areas of my life, connect the dancing with the growth mindset, with the working on the coaching? So I did a lot of research and I found a lot of trainings and I found a lot of work being done around somatic and embodiment. And I decided, great. And this is when I felt like coaching was more complete. And to help our audience understand more what embodied coaching is. Hmm. Um, everyone maybe knows coaching from a sense of like changing of mindset and like, you know, understand your thoughts and self-awareness. But there's another part, which is included in the embodiment, uh, two parts, actually. One of them is the somatic part, which is your own sensations. So, for example, when you tell someone, I'm scared, what does it really mean? How do you know? How, what is the bodily sensation that tells you you are there when you're happy, whatever it is? So kind mm. of understanding the sensations within our body, where they are and how they move around. So we are quicker at identifying things because it's hard to get to the word maybe fear, but it's easy to be like, oh, I'm feeling a sensation in my mm -hmm. chest. The other aspect of it is more about the behavior and the posture. Like how is your posture affecting you? And how do you change behavior because you cannot think a habit. You can't be like, I want to start being patient. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. You have to practice it in your body. It's happening within your muscles. So how do you start noticing how that happens and creating that change that you want? So if mm -hmm. I were to describe it in like a few words, embodied coaching is about noticing the sensations within our body and starting to understand more our postures and our relationship to our muscles and behavioral change within this world and not just what is happening within our mind. Totally. That's a, a great definition. And it's um, it's so wonderful to hear how some of your experience as a dancer has informed who you are as a coach, right? Because as a dancer, I mean, so much of your world is physical is, is driven by physical awareness and, and pushing yourself physically and understanding some of those boundaries. So that's, you know, it's really beautiful. It's also really interesting because we talk a lot about this in nonverbal communication training and, you know, understanding physiological, as you said, uh, reactions to 
stress, to threat, to walking out on a stage and presenting in front of hundreds of people, right? Like it's it's really interesting if you can tap into that physical awareness, you have so much more power and control over how you end up showing up. That's a really powerful thing, I think. Yeah, 100%. And this is, I love how you say it, you have more power and control, like you have kind of an intelligence that you didn't tap into before. It's like additional resources for you. Totally. I love that. An additional intelligence you can just tap into. So on that note, uh, when we think about connecting with our bodies, right? The I, I find a lot of our professional world is biased towards the content and the cerebral and the body just gets left behind. So in your opinion, like what are some of the biggest barriers to people being connected to their bodies in today's world of work? So it's interesting. I think there's multiple parts to it, but the first one is I feel like the lack of knowledge, awareness, and skills to do that because people, we grow up, like, even if you think about it, growing up in school, if you're not, if you have, if you were not an athlete, if you were not a dancer, if you didn't have any physical activities in your life, you don't learn that skill. Like no one tells you, you need to be in tune with your body. No one tells you this is important. And it, I realize that technical people have, are skeptical about it because they think this is very like artsy or like very um, spiritual kind of thinking. So it takes a <laughs> lot. Yeah, it's it's not. <laughs> they're not used to it sure. because it is not. Um, it is not. It's not how they think. Like it's a lot of the technical stuff yeah. when you're working technically a lot. This is a completely different set of skills that you're using Mm -hmm. that you're not used to and you need to kind of also when it comes to the body experiment so you need to be the kind of person who's willing to trust that so develop that trust of like what does it look like if i do this or what does it look like if i do that because it's not you can't do one plus one it's equal to it's not it doesn't work that way Mm -hmm. so it's a lack of skill lack of awareness and a bit of lack of trust in Mm -hmm. that feeling and the last part which is a bit also important is Connecting to our bodies, being being connected to our feelings, being connected to difficult things. You mm-hmm. cannot decide what to be connected to. And some people may not be, I don't want to say ready, but may not um, want to be doing that. They may be more dissociating sometimes or numbing. So it takes a lot of like trauma awareness or maybe just simply understanding of what it's like for people to start slowly going into this world rather than just kind of like rushing into it. Totally. Yeah. I think you bring up a really important point with this kind of work um, that I, I experienced pretty early on when I started, you know, working with people in embodiment and communication and all that is the body, you know, the, the, the book, right. The body keeps the score, like, whether we like it or not, our bodies store memory and information and, you know, sensory data. And the body's going to do that anyways, whether you're attuned to it or aware of it is another thing, right? And that's what you can kind of work to develop. But if you're not careful, and if you're not uh, approaching it with a guide or a coach or a facilitator, I think sometimes you can touch on things that you didn't even know were there, right? And whether it's something as serious as trauma or, or just something that completely shocks you, it can be a pretty, uh, pretty like powerful experience. So I think you're right that like you want to approach this in a sustainable and supported way. Yeah, hundred percent. It's yeah. a, it's important, but a tricky area to go into unprepared. Totally, absolutely. Um, so that's why I just think like such a. I always think it's it, it bears mentioning that with this work that like you can't just like fly into it and (laughs) or start coaching in this space without like understanding what you're dealing with um so that's 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 really great to hear and now right we we have this added it's interesting for some the video can be a barrier but when we actually think about it it's a huge connector and a huge opportunity so how do you within virtual communication specifically where so many people think that they lose all of their body language and all of their everything like how do you bring the body front and center in virtual communication 
Yeah, so I, it does feel like you're losing some of the contact in the sense of like the person being present with you, all of them. You're just seeing kind of a snapshot of what is happening. But also I feel it's an opportunity for multiple reasons. First of all, it's safety because a lot of people within this work or within any work um, maybe don't feel as safe to say some things in person or as comfortable. So virtual gives the opportunity for people, I realize, to communicate more. And that is great. And it, it helps a lot. From what can we do to kind of um, do it better? Or how do we make sure that our body is present? I think my first, it's going to sound like, it's going to sound maybe like a weird tip, but my first tip is turn off the self-view oh, of yourself. That. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Why? Because I always tell that the first level is creating self-awareness. So you have to be in a meeting, be able to feel your own body and be able to be attuned to the other person's body. The problem is when you see yourself, you're no longer present because you're like, oh, I need to move my hair because this is in the way. And you're out of the conversation and focused on yourself. So when you don't, when you remove that, you are giving yourself the opportunity for the first skill, which is curious self-awareness, Mm -hmm. simply monitoring. When Rachel said that, I felt maybe a stronger heartbeat. Oh, great. I note it down. Or I noticed that, I don't know, the person I was talking to moved their head or moved their body differently. And what does that mean about them? And how can I help them feel maybe differently? How can I mirror and help them feel more calm or be in tune with them? So I think it, the first thing is curious self-awareness and the absence of judgment and the absence of like, oh my God, I did this wrong, or I talked this way, or I showed up this way. And then the absence of self-observing, like looking at ourselves and just being critical and focusing on that. Right. So yeah, using the body to be able to connect and be able to understand the person we're talking to. And I think this is a learned skill. So I would say practice, like mm -hmm. consider it, it's an experiment new science for you and just go ahead and play around with it. Um, start noticing what other people show up as or what you show up as and go with that. And the other one, which is going to sound a bit, it's a bit different in the sense of when we are connected virtually all day, if we're not connected to our body, we might forget to move, to yeah. eat, to mm -hmm. drink. And, you know, we forget how much it affects us. Like we could be showing up completely different in a meeting just because of some bodily need that we're not taking mm -hmm. into consideration. Mm -hmm. So make sure that because we are virtual and it's so easy to stay connected and it's so easy to have a call from the airport or have a call from anywhere, how do we make sure that we're not forgetting our own needs also? Um, and not just for us, but to show up for the conversation in a good way that helps it. Yeah, great points. The virtual setting is a little bit of a contradiction almost, right? Because it's you and a screen, but the screen itself is a portal to the other person and connecting with another human being, right? And I think it's really easy to have almost like your mind totally leave your body. And for professionals who are on video, multiple times a day, often back to back, as you said, like being able to remember that you have this very 3D experience that's that's almost always like physical first, right? Your body's always in the physical moment, um, the physical present moment. And to be able to anchor into that and to remind yourself that, oh, I need to get up, I need to walk around, I need to get some fresh air, some water, whatever, can help you then return to that computer, that screen and connect with the human on the other end, but it's, that also is like a muscle that you have to develop. Yeah. Practice. I yeah. mean, you know, the dancers, you're used to it. You're like practice is part of your life, but maybe the usual mental stuff, we're not used to practicing as much. Right. Or like even just like the mind body connection component of, Oh, the, like my awareness just left again. And now I'm slouched again. And now, you know, the, the self-perpetuating behavior of having poor posture, which lowers my energy and makes me feel even more tired and also sends that message to my audience. Like it's all pretty intricate, interrelated stuff, but if you can short circuit the awareness and kind of keep bringing it back to the present moment, keep readjusting yourself in your seat, you know, then over time, your body will start to support you in, in, in ways that I think can often surprise people. Oh, yeah, 100%. And 
just one thing on this is I always talk about is curiosity because I feel we are very hard on ourselves. And how can we make sure that we do exactly what you said every time and all the time while still being open about it? Like taking it yeah. funny, like, oh, I did this again. Let's just sit up instead of like, yeah. I did this again. And then just kind of making it harder because it becomes like, I don't want to create that change anymore instead of I'm excited about that change. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Being patient with yourself, giving yourself grace, like all those good things. Um, so, Zena, we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, but you are leaning into, you know, the new technologies and AI uh, in this coaching space. So what do you leverage for your own coaching when it comes to AI and, and different technologies? So I think the basic one that I felt made a lot of change the concept of virtual communication in itself. I feel within the coaching world, the amount of people that had access to coaching because of that was enormous. The amount of people you could have access to all over the world was enormous. And I think this is big. This is a huge one because I feel a lot of people would not have reached out if it wasn't for that. Just to remember that tech allowed people to have platforms to talk on from their own home if they don't feel safe to be able to do that from there, especially, you know, during the pandemic. But even regardless of that, it opened up a chance of like, hey, I want to try coaching. Hey, I'm ready to see what that means. And it changed a lot of people's lives. And that for me is a huge thing that I love. Um, I love being in person and coaching in person, but this is also something that I feel created a big difference in my life and in my client's life. Mm -hmm. um, there's other two things like your platform, trying out new tools. I think like we forget as coaches that we don't have as much quick, like not, I wouldn't say awareness, but we cannot notice as much as the AI can take in. Like, let's talk about body language. A lot of my clients, when they're you, when you use this kind of technology, when you try it out, it will give you some hints or it will tell you about certain things that you could not have noticed and maybe two, three other people couldn't because that is about enhancing. It's about getting more. You're getting more awareness. You're getting more information. Mm -hmm. And then you have the freedom to do whatever you want with that information. But I say, why not take in that information? Why not be curious and be able to access this kind of information, which, which could, like a small comment, like you, I could go on virtual savings and a small thing it would give me would make me leap forward quickly or quicker than I would have. Right. I think like whether virtual savings or other people that have been working on, like, for example, um, as a coach, how much of pauses do you give? What kind mm -hmm. of questions do you ask? Like all of this kind of work for me feels like huge improvement mm -hmm. um and it's it's worth it from that mm -hmm. sense right and and i feel the last thing is matching coaches with clients like the technology mm -hmm. of ai used in that because i've heard a lot of my clients go away or like say or friends of like oh i didn't want to do coaching anymore because i talked to this one person and it's like no so they kind of like make it that oh coaching is not working for me or this is not going to help me and they miss out on opportunities because I've tried it, you know, I don't know if you've tried, like if you go online to look for a coach or mm -hmm. for a therapist or any, yeah. it's very hard to find someone yep. or the right someone. I think this yeah. is a better word. You find thousands of people, but to find the person that will work for you is a bit tough. So I don't know, leveraging mm -hmm. AI in this is huge. Yeah, no, those are three great use cases. Um, it's interesting because all of them help you as a coach augment your like the, the work that you actually really care about, right? Yeah, and it helps the, like it's kind of helping me and the client too, so it's great. Right, yeah, and I also love that you mentioned that there are opportunities for you as a coach to leverage technology to improve your own coaching, right? Like I think sometimes coaches neglect that they need some support and coaching and you know, you're so focused on the people you're trying to help that you forget to help yourself. So that's like a really nice reminder as well. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, Zaina, that's that's all we have time for today. But thank you so much for sharing your perspective. It's so valuable, I think, to always bring the body back into the center of of everything, really. Um, so for our audience, how can they get in touch with you directly, follow more of your work? 
Yeah, so they can find me on LinkedIn, Zaina Habib, exactly the way my name is written here. And they can also find me on Instagram, Zaina Voice Within. Um, this is my website and my brand. It's called Voice Within. I have a website also. Um, and I'd be happy, like they can reach out, you know, whether via message on LinkedIn or Instagram or through the website, and I'll be happy to get back to them and help them in however way they would want to. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Zaina. And thank you, of course, as always, to our listeners for another conversation in the future of work. Thank you.